and welcome to the BAFTA Big Break session. My name is Emma Morgan and I am your chair today. Um, I'm also creative director and executive producer at Firecracker Films and in the last couple of years I've been making programmes such as Mums Make Porn, Emma Willis Delivering Babies and I'm currently making a six-part series with Stacey Dooley when she sleeps over with different families across the UK. But today I'm here with my BAFTA hat on as I'm on their television committee. BAFTA is mostly known for its awards which celebrate the gold standard of excellence across the British film, television and games industries. But BAFTA is also a charity that supports many initiatives to encourage and support new talent into our industry from across diverse backgrounds. So whatever stage you are at in your career, BAFTA has something for you and your skills and personal development. From hundreds of events with BAFTA winners and nominees throughout the year to talent development programs like Guru Live, Breakthrough Brits and BAFTA Crew. And of course, as you become more experienced, you can become a BAFTA member. So please do check BAFTA out on social media and at BAFTA.org. So uh, today, I'm delighted to be chairing a panel of brilliant and inspiring young talent who will be talking us about their careers. Um, just to give you a quick intro, we have Ellie Flynn, who is an investigative journalist and presenter. And under the Ellie Undercover um, banner, she has made a number of documentaries for BBC Three, exposing issues that affect young people across the world. Uh, the most recent episode, which was just released in April, and still on iPlayer, still on iPlayer, yeah. um, sees her investigate <coughs> two multi-level marketing companies that are accused of illegal pyramid selling. Yeah. Um, she's also um, made films about the island's abortion referendum and fake homelessness and child marriage in the USA. We also have Elisa here, who is a Brazilian independent documentary filmmaker who focuses on social issues and tries to amplify voices from marginalised sections of society. Her first feature was the multi-award winning Here Is So Far and is based on encounters with women during a seven-month trip in Africa. Her second movie, The Tortoise and the Tapir, investigates the gigantic hydroelectric plant built and planned in the middle of the Amazon forest during Brazil's worst drought in decades. Her latest film, Your Turn, is about the student takeover of schools in response to educational cut budget cuts in Brazil. Um, and on our end here, we have Lizzie, who directed her first film, which was Manchester Bomb, our story, whilst on the BBC Young Director Scheme last year. Previous to that, she has produced the BAFTA-nominated How to Die, Simon's Choice, Chris Packham, Living with Asperger's, as well as the series Inside Harley Street. She was recently nominated for the BAFTA Breakthrough Talent Award and is currently co-directing a 90-minute film for BBC Two about Sally Challen, who killed her husband in 2010. So to start off, each of our panellists have chosen clips um, from their films and we thought we would let them introduce them and then we'll show the clips and then we'll have a conversation. And there'll be a chance at the end of this session for you to all ask questions, so do start putting your thinking caps on to ask interesting and challenging questions. Okay, so um, Ellie, do you want to introduce your clip? Yes, so um, I've got a couple of clips from some of the documentaries that I've made. Um, I've chosen a few that show uh, my undercover documentaries. I've made three uh, Ellie undercovers now for BBC Three, um, and that was the first, the way that I got into TV, and um, the first two that I made were undercover programmes. Um, and then I've also got a short clip from America's Child Brides just to show the non-undercover stuff that I also do. So, let's show the clips. Brilliant. Um, and then moving on, Elisa, would you like to tell us about your clip? Yeah, I came just with the teaser, the trailer of the film. It was premiered yesterday here in Sheffield, mm -hmm. and we have another screening on 11th. So it's more to give the flavour of the film that is called Your Third. Excellent. And finally, um, Lizzie, do you want to tell us about your clip? 
Um, yes, this is a clip from the film I directed last year, Manchester Bomb, Our Story, um, which was part of the BBC New Director Scheme. Well, thank you all. Um, so, starting right at the very beginning, when did you decide, all of you separately, that you wanted to be a documentary maker? Where did that come from? Was it something you always aspired to, or did it sort of evolve? So, maybe starting with you, Lizzie. Um, it wasn't something um, that I knew I wanted to do, probably till I'd just left university. Because when I was younger, it just wasn't really a job that I thought... It wasn't on my radar at all. I didn't think it was possible. Um, and so I went to university and decided to do journalism. And because I'd always had an interest in, in kind of news, even when I was much younger, or telling stories. I like, worked a newspaper doing work experience. And when I was like, you know, 11, I was kind of... I remember being at school and being interested in, in things like that then. But I went to uni and did news and then graduated and worked in a newsroom and very quickly identified that the stories were being kind of turned out quite quickly and I couldn't really, you know, I kind of wanted to go in a bit more depth with them and peel back the layers and, and speak to people and kind of just explore it more. And so I then um, kind of went into current affairs programmes and again, it didn't, something didn't quite sit, because although you could say in like the headlines kind of what you wanted to come out of the films, you didn't really feel it. And so it kind of naturally, I realised that actually I want to make films about people and tell their stories in quite an in-depth way. And so it kind of naturally took me in that direction. And was that similar for you? Because you started as yeah, a journalist as well. Yeah, similar. I also had no idea that it was... A job that I could do in, in in the same way it wasn't really on my radar. Um, I studied in journalism as well and then was doing a bit of freelance writing and I'd written an article for Vice that ended up going viral. Um, long story short, my photos were used on, on a catfish account for eight years, me and all my friends. Um, so I wrote this article about that and it got really picked up and I kept getting all these phone calls from newspapers who wanted to run the story. And then I got an email from a production company who said, uh, do you want to be a part of a documentary? And I was like, absolutely not, no thank you. Um, and so went off and was working in an online newsroom and had the same sort of issues that Lizzie did where it was really, it was a fast turnaround. You know, I was writing stories like 10 ways to spider-proof your home and I, was, <laughs> I just don't think this is for me. Um, and I, I'd always really enjoyed investigations and I was trying to do, I was trying to pitch more and do as many as I can, but in an online newsroom when you've got to hit eight stories a day or something to compete with the Daily Mail, then you, you don't really have that many opportunities to. Um, and so about a year later, this production company got back in contact with me and said, you don't have to talk about your story, but would you want to investigate other people's experiences? And I was like, okay, yeah, I kind of want to get out of this. That sounds like a good idea. Um, so we had all these meetings, and I was going for coffees with this executive producer, Rory, and um, I met the BBC commissioner, Jeanne, and it was sort of this mad thing that I would just email about every, every now and then. I didn't think it would actually happen. And um, uh, the catfish story never actually got commissioned, but we came up with the Ali undercover idea and then got a phone call one day saying, it's been commissioned, can you start? And I was like, I've got a job. <laughs> so I just went and handed in my notice and started a month later. So yeah, it was a bit of a, bit of a punt. <laughs> so a bit of a leap of faith. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And um, what about you, Elisa? Was your introduction different? Because is filmmaking in Brazil quite a different process rather than just making it for telly? Do you have to get funding? Your films look like feature docs. How does that all work? Uh, I think I started kind of the same. I, I studied journalism, and during university, I saw, like, my friends were staying inside a room, calling people and making interviews. And I was like, no, I don't want to be this person. I, I really want to go and talk with people looking in the eyes. So I understand I should go to image. So I started taking pictures. And then we, the first class that I had with video, I really felt in love with that. And I started to, to make videos. And I feel 
really lucky because when I started this class in university, we used those big cameras and there was a room to make the editing. Yeah, I feel really old saying that, but it's like that was the beginning of the process. And in my very last year in the university came new technology. So there was a small camera and a computer. So in the last year, I was able to learn how to use that. And it gave me a lot of uh, possibilities because internet was kind of is starting to produce films, and there, in Brazil there were no... I didn't know people that was traveling alone and making videos. Mm. So I started to do that. I traveled a lot in Latin America, and then I made a trip from Panama to, to the US talking about women immigration and doing a lot of different things to pay the trip. So I was writing, taking pictures, making a series for a, a web a uh, web channel about culture and doing another for a TV by my, by my own. And that trip, it was 2008, it really transformed me because I was also an immigrant traveling in that road, so I was able to, to see these mirrors that I think the, it's the most beautiful thing in documentary, you know, when you are able to really connect with the person and then make the audience connect with that person. And two years later, I went to Africa. I, I stayed like seven months traveling in Africa, doing some shorts for TV too. But I, I felt that there were lo much more things that I would like to say that wouldn't fit on the TV program, that were like three minutes articles. And I want to put my voice and, and my reflections about what it should be a woman, a Brazilian woman traveling by my own in, in Africa, trying to do not judge what I was seeing, that it's really easy to judge yeah, yeah. when we are in Africa now, and really trying to, to talk about that in a more personal way. So I made a crowdfunding. Crowdfunding was starting yeah. in Brazil that moment, and I got the money to make this first feature. And I had no idea what it means to make a feature film. <laughs> like I, yeah. I came from, the, from journalism, and it was really cool to have, to go to festivals and start to talk with people about, that experience, and then I really start to do more and more documentaries. This is my third feature, yeah. and I made a lot of shorts. So what's your team like? Is it just you and a camera, or when you're traveling, making your films, how, what's your team look like? This film in Africa I was by my own, and then came people to the post-production, to the editing process in post-production. The second one, we were traveling in three, I was the person making the videos, and there was a producer and a, a photographer, a, big, a still photographer. But you shoot your own content. Yeah, Yeah, because we were making a web series for a Greenpeace, mm -hmm. and then with the footage we decided to make a feature. Mm -hmm. And this one, thanks God, is the first one that we're making as a film. So we, we got a co-producer that is global, that is the, one of the biggest media groups in Brazil. And then we got another TV, Canal Curta. And so we had, like, Brazil in the last decades is really growing in terms of uh, public money to, to make culture. If you see here, there are seven films, Brazilian films, in, this, yeah. in Sheffield Festival. It's like, if probably 15 years ago, if there was one, it would be uh, too much. No? So we, we, are, we are really having... We were having this moment in Brazil where people were really able to get money to productions, but since two years ago, the, we lost the Minister of Culture of Brazil. Yeah. We have a new extreme right-wing president yeah. that is really trying to criminalize uh, artists and culture, and there is like a judge battle they just frozen all the money for, for the cinema in Brazil and then came back and then they frozen again. And we are living a very, a very hard moment. Yeah. We don't know if probably next year in Sheffield we have a lot of films because we still are doing the films. But I don't know if in three years we have the same, uh, the same moment that, I don't know, yeah. Brazil just uh, won two well, big, big prizes in Cannes. Yeah. No, and it's a very new thing for us. When I was studying journalism, I didn't know that Brazil could produce film. So, yeah. yeah, we are in this moment, like, in one side, we are really proud of ourselves to be 
doing, making beautiful films in the other, we don't know how it will be in the next years. Um, so, before, it sort of feels like you've covered it a bit, like your lucky break, but do, before you um, sort of got to make your big films, do, were there other little critical moments where you think, I mean, obviously you wrote your article, but yeah. you're talking about Rory. What, 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 when you made your first film, what were the moments that you really thought were critical to learning your craft and helping shape your career and your success so it wasn't just one, a one-off yeah, I think... Um, Flash in the pan. <laughs> I think oh, it was definitely a lucky break in terms of the fact that Rory had seen this article and, and wanted to work with me. Um, but from the off, I said, I don't, want to, I don't want to leave my job and do this if I'm not part of the production team. I always said, I, I want to work as a researcher on this. I want to be an integral part of the team making this documentary because I'm a journalist. I didn't really have any interest in being a presenter for the sake of being a presenter. Um, so I think that that's helped because I've, I've still got my skills as a journalist, I'm still using them and I'm still a part of every production that I'm making and I'm, I'm trying to use those skills and I think that that's helped with everything I've made. So I, Rent for Sex came out January 2018 and I've just finished my seventh film. So it's been, it's been going quite well so far and I think that's because I'm, I'm working as a part of the team quite hard. And how does that work? Are you freelance and then you work on a production each or do you have like a tranche, like say three films, and that you can work across all of them at the same time? Yeah, so I'm I'm freelance, and it's a bit of both. I mean, I think as well, everyone thinks that once you've been on TV, that's it. It's like you're constantly doing one thing from the next. As a freelancer, it's always a bit of a hustle. So there's sometimes when maybe you've got a couple of months break, and then there's sometimes when you're juggling three films at a time. Um, so I'm I'm still writing. I'm still keeping up with my other skills as well um, and sometimes I'll be working on multiple productions at once um, but I'm always also pitching ideas keeping in contact with execs that I know and that I've met keeping in contact with the BBC directly and trying to think up new ideas that I want to work on and issues that I want to investigate. So you have to make your own luck really to a certain degree? Yeah I think so I think there's definitely an element of, of a bit of luck in finding that first opportunity um, but you definitely can't just rest on your laurels once you get that you have to then keep pushing because no one's you know it's not anyone else's job to give you a job almost you have to really try and work hard and and show that you're good at it and show that you're the best person to do something and also documentaries they're just stories they're people's stories and channels and execs they need those stories as much as you do so if you go out and find them and you say i've got this amazing access and i've got this idea and i'm going to work it up then you're valuable and and then you can, yeah, make your own luck a bit that way. And then, but with you, Lizzie, your career seems, you know, you've had this big moment, you've had a BAFTA nomination, but obviously it wasn't, didn't just come out of the blue. Can you talk us through the sort of evolution of how you got to that point and made that transition as well from being a producer working on some really important films to actually having your moment in the director's chair, as it were? Yeah, it was quite, it, um, it's quite strange because you say big break and it sounds like it's just like kind of come out of nowhere. Um, and I say I went to uni to do journalism, but it, it, it was quite a commitment to do three years at university for broadcast journalism that's quite specific. Because then if you graduate, it, it's not a broad subject where you can go into anything. So before I started at Leeds Uni, I basically was like, I need to know if kind of working in TV or media is something that I, you know, I know what it's about and, and will I enjoy it. So I kind of, I basically, I lived in the northwest in Cheshire, so I printed my CV, which basically had on it that I worked in a news agency and as a waitress. And I went round production companies in Liverpool and Manchester um, and a range of production companies, kind of factual, uh, children's entertainment, all sorts of things, and kind of literally knocked on the door and begged for work experience, basically. Just said, please let me in to like, make the tea. And so, and, and luckily, um, someone did let me in to make the tea. And so I was able to be a runner while I was at uni um, and kind of just see, again, to kind of see what I liked about it. So it really was, it's honestly just totally kind of um, f from that position and working my way up, um, you know, and being quite grateful, I guess, to think it's a junior researcher and researcher and AP, and at each stage, like, you learn so much. Um, and I guess if you're, you know, just completely kind of dedicated and hardworking, obviously then people will give you 
the next job. And, but it's, it's compe- I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's, it's possible to get into it if you really want it. Um, it's competitive, but if you work really hard, um, you'll kind of get it, won't you? And then, and then when I was an AP, I decided to move to London. I was like, oh, I need to... I identified really good docs directors that I just thought... I just thought their films were amazing or they did something really different and wrote to them personally and asked if I could work with them um, just to see how they... to learn from them, I guess, as a producer, as an AP and then a producer. Um, who were they? Who were they? So, uh, who did I write? Inspiration uh, right. characters. <laughs> I ended up working with Vanessa Rengel, who's a very distinct um, documentary maker. I think I wrote to Ben Anthony at the time. For example. Quite a few different people. Who um, responded out of the pit? Um, quite a lot. A lot of people responded. And then I guess it's a combination of doing that and then a bit of luck. Because Vanessa did... She needed somebody. And so that meant I was able to kind of work with her. And in a way, that was quite a break because it took me into working on... Um, kind of single films for BBC Two, of which there aren't that you know there aren't that many single films and mm-hmm. and doc series of that nature. So I guess in that way, and then I guess working with people you know that I thought were kind of top of their game in the kind of UK documentary makers on kind of broadcast TV, their expectations are quite high. So you you know you kind of feel this constant pressure to do the best job you possibly can. I guess. I mean, as an exec myself, sometimes you can see really young, ambitious people who are really hungry mm. for their first break, but at the same time, quite often you want to say to people, be really good at each part of the job as you go. Yeah, because I... you keep trying to step up, do you think there's that, that advice about sometimes working in a maybe a lower um, job in an excellent piece of work is uh, the way you would... Yeah, you like sort I sort of proved yourself. I did always find it quite odd because when we were like in our twenties, and I was kind of a researcher or AP, I'd be working with people, and they were like, "I just want to direct." Um, and I did think it was quite strange, in in a way, because each role in a production team has different things you learn and skills that are kind of integral to understanding the whole process. And so a lot of people I did know were very, com- you know, kind of jumped right to the top. And obviously that does work for some people, but I just found in other industries, you kind of learn your craft and you train. You know, you wouldn't just go f- from one day being a doctor to suddenly a surgeon in like two weeks. So I just felt like, hang on, there's this, you have to kind of learn it quite carefully and, with, and work with different people and see how they work. Because creatively, that's really exciting as well. Um, you know, and some people are ex- exceptionally organised and, you know, other people work in a different way. So I just found that, yeah, I just kind of found it fine. I didn't, I wasn't always thinking I definitely want to be a director. I just thought I'm enjoying working on films like this. And and then I started to think, oh, actually, maybe I would like to direct. When I was producing at a certain point, I thought, oh, may- actually, maybe I can. Yeah. It took quite a lot of confidence to feel that I could, if you know was there anyone particularly in your career that, that's been inspirational to you, Elisa? Or do, do you feel it feels like you just made your own opportunities? Again. Um, so it was, the way you were describing your career, it sounds like you, a lot of it, you made your own luck and you were sort of opportunistic and really clever about doing that yourself. But were there any individuals who helped you to inspire you and actually shape your career? Uh, I think I had a lot of a lot of moments that people, for example, this trip, trip that I made in, in, from Panama to US, I presented a, a project. I was like, I, I, I had just graduated. I didn't have a portfolio or a curriculum. And I presented you this, uh, a big TV, TV program. And the, the, the major journalist from this program, she, she was like, yes, go. We will make a series about your trip. And please, just don't do any TV things. Be creative. And I was like, whoa, that's the best thing you can... Someone can tell you when you are 20-something something years old, no, like, to be creative. And I really think she was one of the persons that put me, put me like that. And, yeah, and, for example, in my second film, when I was trying to see people, we didn't have any money for post-production. One day, one guy wrote me and he was like, oh, I am a publisher, I work with publicity, and I really love your work, and I want to collaborate. And I was like, what? And he came to talk with me after any screening, and he was like, yeah, my, 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 my daughter, she's like a teenager now, and what, what, what I would tell her? 
that I that I sell uh, sell things. No, I want to do something that really matters. And he entered in the second film, doing all the color post production and all the things, no money, and with his heart. So I really, and I think when we go, I don't know. I think my story with documentary films is that I'm really curious about things, and I, 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 I have a lot of passion about them. And I think when we are like that, I cannot sleep if I do not talk about this topic. It's something bigger than me. And I think when we, we are really connected with this feeling, we connect with other people that is also connected with this feeling. For example, in the crowdfunding process in the first feature, one guy wrote me, uh, we were asking 25,000 reais, that that moment would be like ten thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and one of I received an email very well written saying, "Oh, I I listened to your interview in the radio and blah blah blah, and I like it." The, and then I saw your website and I really like the way you are talking about things. And on day five, I will donate ten thousand reais for the project. And I was like, "It's not possible." And then the guy, and I was like, what do you want? Do you want to, pr- don't know. And do you want to talk by Skype? And he was like, after I give you the money, you can talk. And he was like, even if you don't get the 25,000, I will give you the money to make this film. And I was like, what do you want? I want you to make this film. And I was like, whoa, I didn't know that people, as th- there were people like you in this world. And he was like, there are a lot of people like me. You just, just have to know how to go with your message to these people. And that phrase, I was like, okay. And it really empowered me to, to keep the passion and keep doing things. And almost just jump in. Yeah. And, and this film, I, I really like this story. I was working with 30 more people in another, in another thing, when I started an occupation of Sao Paulo Assembly. And I saw on Facebook, and I was starting the producing of a TV series, one of the topics would be education, so I was like, it would be nice to go to this occupation just to talk with students. So I asked my boss to do not go in the other day to go to the occupation. And one of the 30 persons that were working there, she just came, her name is Mariana Genesca, and she came and she was like, I heard that you are going to this occupation. Can I go with you? And I was, yes. And we entered in the occupation, and we felt in love with the students, what the way they were doing, like, politics, and in a very aesthetic way, they were putting all the fights in their bodies, in the way they, they were there. And in the end, we went to stay one or two hours, we say, until the end of the occupation, I slapped them with the students. And in the other day, Mariana looked to my eyes and she was like, we have to make a film about that. And we just met a few days before, and she's the producer of this film, and we started a very big partnership. We, have, we are working the second pro- in the third project together right now, and it was like two years and a half ago. So I think when we find partners, yeah. something happened, or like some chemistry happened, and we start to... to those yeah, key collaborations support. are really yeah. important, aren't they? Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting, when you're in the lucky position of having people's ear, where do you go and look for your stories? I mean, where, when, when you're making your films now, do you, people come to you and say, we'd like you to make this film, or are you starting to look for the stories yourself? It's kind of a little bit of both, I guess, in some ways, because development is really really hard isn't it in terms of you've got an interesting or you think you've got you know you've got an interesting story or subject and then you know what the I guess what the commissioner may want or the channel may want you have to really take because you've got this idea in your head oh my gosh it's the most amazing idea um but the BBC or Channel 4 or whoever might already be making a film of a a similar subject about it and also you've got to have a kind of distinct take on something. Um, so I remember a couple of years ago wanting to do something about a, a private abortion clinic in Northern Ireland, but it wasn't really at the time that topical or kind of in the news. And it was about like, women, you know, their bodies and legal abortion and should it be legal. And then only recently, obviously, everything that's happened in America, someone at the BBC was like, Oh, have you thought about doing something about illegal abortion in the US? So it's kind of strange because it didn't happen two years ago, but it's something that I really. 
uh, I felt quite passionate about that should be made. But it's kind of about timing as well as just having yeah. the idea. So uh, you, are you doing that, that film there? Well, well, I'm just developing it at the moment. Um, but again, just trying to find kind of an interesting... And I guess it's not just the idea, it's also how feasible is that idea to make. So, you know, kind of making it... And it's quite a kind of simple initial process because it might be access to, I don't know, like a particular hospital or an individual person. And you can make those calls yourself, to, you know, and literally ring them and see if even filming with those people is, you know, a realistic idea. Yeah. And then it kind of makes the the idea development more possible. And then that's when you do get access, access and then people go, actually, you know, we don't want it now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because yeah, sometimes you just think, how can they not want this? This is so great. And, and it doesn't happen, which is a bit disappointing, but I guess that's part of the development process. And often, I guess, now, because I, was, I tend to work in production and have my own ideas in the background, but often people come and say, this, you know, we're making this. Do you, do you want to work on it? Um, so, so they've what, already worked it up. What was it like for you when you got that moment? You've been producing with lots of great directors and now you have your first film and you're in the director's chair and you're like, this is brilliant, but actually quite terrifying. What, it was, what it was, was what absolutely was like? terrifying. It was absolutely <laughs> the most terrifying <laughs> thing I've ever done in my career because, yeah, I had worked on, you know, with brilliant directors um, on really interesting films and, then, and I'd not shot a lot myself at all, um, because I'd worked with great directors who could shoot, or really good directors of photography. And so, th I also didn't sleep a lot before even starting at Blake Quay North, where I made the film, because I was like, I can't, what if I can't shoot? What if I press the wrong button? What if, you know, all those kind of questions. Um, and actually, it all worked out in the end, because it's kind of better to just, conf what I did learn quite quickly, is just like confront the fear and do it, and the first, you know, you rush is, are going to be far from beautiful. Um, but if they're in focus and you've recorded them, then that's great. And then it just gets... <laughs> and then, because you look at people's films and, like, some of the best directors, and you look, and they're such amazing shooters, and you, you're thinking, oh, God, I want it to be that straight away. And then you're like, hang on, of course you have to kind of learn and improve. Um, and Blake Wayne North had the idea for the film in that case, so that wasn't my own idea at all. Um, and it was hard because I hadn't done an edit before, and the edit was—I think the edit was meant to be like maybe seven or eight weeks or something—and I think it might have gone into about fifteen weeks because <laughs> I was just sat there and I was like, "It's not working." I had like the, the, the makings of it, interviewing people and capturing the actuality was all okay, and then it got to the edit, and I was like, "I don't know why it's." You put it together, and you're like, "It's not working," and I don't know why. So had you my not poor been in an edit today. at all before then? When no, you, when I'd, you produced, you weren't going into... I'd worked across the edits a lot um, and had been involved in kind of the... Edit, like, had a lot of input as a producer in kind of the editorial and, and had kind of put scenes together and clipped things up a lot. But I hadn't done a, a full edit myself. Um, and in a way, uh, that kind of first film... I don't think I could have made more mis mistakes in a way, or it couldn't have been harder in terms of a learning curve. And everyone kept saying to me at the time, don't worry, it's great to have, you know, to do this now, because you'll learn so much. But at the time, you just think, oh my gosh, I'm a total failure. <laughs> like, what is... And then it kind of all works out in the end. And there is a weird moment learn a in lot. the edit when it goes from utter shit to, to oh, actually quite good. <laughs> yeah, like, it seems to, it seems <laughs> to be working. But, um, yeah, it's quite, it, it's hard. It's hard, isn't it, doing it for the first time? And I think you I have think to accept it will be. Yeah. I, I bet you in the next one you'll be going, oh, God. Yeah. And then suddenly yes, the weird yeah. alchemy happens and it all starts to come together again. Um, do, do you find that with your edits or do you just know effortlessly that it's going to be beautiful? <laughs> or when you're cutting your films, how long do you no. normally take? No, I think if you are not in crisis during the process, the film won't be good because you have to have this feeling of what the fuck am I doing with my life? You know? yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, this, this film, like, you could see like three minutes of the film, imagine 93 minutes in this rhythm, it's like, because we try to put the same energy of the student's movement in the structure of the film, and we talked with... We had a study group with ex-high school students, so they were watching the cuts and they were talking what they think, and I, I made this script, and then there are three protagonists, not just one, three, so they are like, they were changing the script, and they, we were making together, 
And the editor, when he started to work with the, the footage, he was like, and I was like, how are you? And he was like, I start to smoke much more. <laughs> and I was like, oh, sorry about that. And all the process was really intense. Yeah. And we were trying to put this, this feeling in the film. And there were, there were moments that I was like, oh, it's working. And there were moments that it was like, I don't know what to do with that. Yeah. And in the end, it was kind of hard to finish the film because in some way I felt the film was not done. We were accepting some festivals in Brazil and we were like, no, thank you, we have to keep working. And when we finished the film, we had our premiere at Berlinale. And three days before I go to Berlin, I was like, what am I doing with my life? I don't... And I, I discovered that the MOVE Theater had uh, 1,200 seats. And I was like, oh my God, we have just 10 people there. I don't want to go. And I feel really, really, really... I, I never felt in my life like that. And I'd say like 90 minutes of the film, like what I did with... It's horrible. People, they are not understand what is going on. It's a lot of information, a <laughs> lot of subtitles. I just want to escape. I don't <laughs> want to be here until the end of the film. I was feeling horrible. 90 minutes is a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, you know, and I was just looking to the side to see people's face. And I was like, it was really scary. And in the end, that was the very best screening of the film. People just went and say like four minutes clapping. And I was like... Oh, thanks. I was wrong, <laughs> but I was like a bit really hard to. This process was really hard. Yeah. Um, what are, what's the best advice you've ever been given while you've been making films, and what advice would you give to any aspiring sort of documentary makers? Um, well, actually, the best advice I've ever been given personally is to do with undercover. And it's just to act happy and stupid the whole time. Um, so just sort of go in and smile, like just like you don't know what's going on, and no one will suspect you. And it's I don't know if I'm just naturally quite good at that, but it's worked so far so well. Um, what about the wigs? Is there any sort of? Yeah, no, they're really good, aren't they? Really I actually, that was that, I didn't want to say it, but that was why I chose that clip because I just thought everyone might want to get a wig after seeing yeah. it. Um, I, I think a little sideline, couldn't you? I Ellie's do. wigs. Oh god, business idea. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, and I think someone as well recently told me just to not focus, you know, obviously... The camera? Good, <laughs> not focus the camera, just <laughs> ideally, could you try and get that as blurry as possible? <laughs> um, no, to, to try and develop skills outside of, outside of just interviewing or like just outside of my on-screen reporting. So keep writing, um, keep trying to do other forms of journalism, and also like to try and learn about the production. You know, I didn't know a thing about... TV production. I didn't. I didn't know what an edit was. I had no idea that so much work. I mean, I still find it mad how much work goes into these. You sort of. I was one of those people that watched a TV program and thought that someone just sort of like walked in, asked a few questions, and walked off. Um, so just to learn as much as you possibly can, and to try and develop your skills in as many areas as possible, is the best advice that I've been given. And then to other people, sort of just to echo what I said earlier, there's stories everywhere and look for them, listen to people. You know, it might be your mum's mate saying that someone keeps stealing her bin. That's probably not going to make a documentary, but, you know, something else might. So, yeah, think about stories and try and, and, try and work on your own access and, and take that maybe to people. And what would you, your advice be, Lizzie? Um, to work on subjects that you're motivated by and you care about. Definitely, because when you're making something, it just takes it does it takes over your life a little bit, you know. And you know, it's not a nine to five, so you're working with people and making films about people's lives, and you should care about how you're portraying their lives, because you're putting it on a screen for millions of people to judge, and write on Twitter or whatever else they're doing. Um, and so you you end up kind of having relationships with the people you're filming that are incredibly close, and they will you know, you'll be speaking to them at all hours of the day and night. And so if you're not passionate about or care about the subjects you're making a film about, that will probably end up showing, I think, in the final piece and vice versa. If you really care, then that's probably how you're going to make the best films you can. That's an interesting point. We're at a particular time where we're re everyone's reassessing duty of care and it's mm. particularly important, but it, it is a core part of producing, isn't it? Is how you care about your contributors and that documentary relationship about 
caring about them, being intensely involved with them, but also not being too involved because yeah. when you leave, yeah, and that's also, to, yeah. I think people don't necessarily think really about that process balance. of disengaging mm. from your contributors in a way that's kind and considerate, but also and you are psychologically there, yeah. responsible. Isn't and it? I think it's a fine line because they have to trust you um, a lot to get the best out <coughs> of them, but, but also you're there to do a job. Mm. Um, that is the purpose of why you're there, not to be their friend. So I think to k it is a fine balance, and if you can keep it, then th then that's the best. Um, you know, it's the best possible you can do, and you can you can do that. And I always think when I'm filming people, even if it's a really you know difficult subject or they're you know it's morally complex and someone might be in the wrong, I just think if I honestly think if it was my family, how would I feel? And it sounds a bit trite, but I just think don't. <laughs> Don't kind of take advantage of people or to be too voyeuristic and then just, mm. just kind of walk out and just ha have, you know, that it's their lives and this will play out for a very long time after you've finished the job. It'll play out for them. So just keep that in your head, I think. Yeah. Mm. And what's your, what would be your key piece of advice that you would give to aspiring filmmakers? Yeah, I think this point of put your place in the... Imagine how would you be in the other side? I think it's really important. And I think when we, if you are starting a career, it's like try to be really honest about why you want to make that and try to understand where inside you is this topic. Because I think in general, we are trying, when we make documentaries, we are trying to understand better the world so why I'm trying to understand this part of the world, where is the connection between this point and myself and my story? Because I think it really helps to, to be there, to be really in the topic and keep curious about that. And a lot of time you asked about money and how to start. Of course, you can work for a channel and there are a lot of paths, but I think we have to start. Mm -hmm. Because we have to, it's really hard to make our first thing and discover we are not a genius and we are not the best filmmaker. So just do that and don't be afraid to, do, to discover that you are not the best filmmaker in the world. That's totally okay. <laughs> like, so do it. If you don't have money, just connect with friends and people that you don't know that may be in passion with the same topic and make it possible and then you can find ways to, to put your film in a TV, in festivals, on whatever. But just to have this feeling of produce, because it, I think it's, it's, it, it's I don't know, I, I feel really proud when, even if it's not the best film, I, I, I saw the thing and say, I did it, mm. done. No, like, next one, so this feeling of keep going. Mm. So. Um, I think that's the end of my main questions, and I'd be really, ready for the audience to start asking questions so we if people can start to think if they've got something to say if you put your hands up but please wait for one of the um one of the team to come to you with a microphone so that we can all hear you so um do we have house lights or anything like that so we can see <laughs> i'm like squinting yeah <laughs> <laughs> um Hello. 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 Um, I think Do you want to tell us who you are? Oh, sorry. Why you're here? That would be good. I'm Claire. I'm a composer. And um, I think it was mostly Ellie and Lizzie who said this, but Eliza, it might be you as well, saying that when you were younger, you didn't really consider being filmmakers. Um, and I kind of had a similar experience being a composer. I was just sort of a songwriter, and I didn't even think about being a TV composer until I was at university. I actually changed my degree halfway through. Because um, I think we're just... I don't know, if you're from a certain background, you might not even sort of even consider it. You might not think, oh, I could go into the TV industry. Uh, what would you say would be good for us? Like, what can we do to get sort of younger people um, from maybe working class backgrounds, um, you know, who may, may not even be considering a TV career? You know, what would you say that we can do um, to sort of encourage them and, yeah. <laughs> So what, what can the delegates themselves do? Or? Yeah, well, uh, or us as an industry. Because um, I think, you know, sometimes we might, you know, we found our own paths into the industry. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, younger people 
if we if they can get in a bit younger then you know maybe they won't be you know having to struggle through mm. so much um can i sort of i think that's a really really interesting question it's especially when we're at a festival like this because it feels once you're in the club it's you can start yeah. to work out where it is and i've been involved in loads of schemes for ages in BAFTA, we do loads of schemes in Channel 4 and Edinburgh. We all do these schemes. But getting the message out to people really, really young when they're at schools, I think is the hardest thing. And I would just say to anyone who has any opportunity to connect at really grassroots level, if someone goes, could you come and do a chat at our school? Or, mm -hmm. we've, you know, there's a youth club here or whatever, because it's so hard to connect with people to get them into the diversity schemes or whatever and i've been a mentor for loads of people but quite a lot of them have already got to college mm. so it's making it feel that those jobs can be for anyone and those so uh, let's throw it out to everyone anyone who's got any kind of purchase on the industry to go out and try and connect at really really early stages and go and talk at a school or a club that would be amazing so it's so hard. I mean, I get quite a few messages from, from people at school, um, sort of 16 to 18, and they're like, oh, I really, really want to do it, and, and how do I do it? And I always try and reply to people, and I'll sort of say, you know, these are, these are the work experience schemes that you can look at. Um, if you want to make your own films and sort of uh, put it on YouTube or even look at documentaries that you like, email execs that you would like to work with. And I know that sounds really overwhelming to tell a 16-year-old, but I sort of think if they've they've already come to me into a message to ask how to do it, then they probably would feel happy to go send an email to someone else. So just try and speak to people and make them feel like it is possible. Because, I mean, if I've done it, anyone can. I think the work experience thing, though, is really difficult because if you come from a fairly comfortable family and you can work for free for a couple of weeks yeah. or even get to London, but um, I had someone come end up coming to me through a diversity scheme who was 29 but he came all the way from Northern Ireland he came from a traveler background and he dropped out of school and when I was going through his CV I was thinking it was quite eclectic and eccentric but I just thought the very fact that you've made it here in front mm -hmm. of me today makes you extraordinary and of course I gave him a job and someone else he's brilliant and someone else poached him and he's now doing amazingly well <laughs> in another company but it is sometimes it's just recognizing that not everyone has mm -hmm. the same cv mm -hmm. and sometimes it's the people with the more eclectic interesting backgrounds are the people you should give the opportunity to so i think that would be something that we could all do yeah i was going to say it's hard when work experience isn't paid yeah. Because it just knocks out a huge amount of people instantly. Yeah. These families cannot afford to uh, to support them or pay for them to travel every day, and yeah. and I just think that is that's something that you know I mean, even needs if you to had be a looked scheme, at. Which every indie yeah. went every year we will do yeah. two you know two funded work yeah. experiences where we'll pay people's travel and expenses and living it for a week or two yeah. weeks. It would just be a start, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because I always think that I always think think because anyone can do the job like anyone can talk to people and we'll have stories to tell from any but you just know getting in the door but it's just like exactly it's just like just getting yeah get, get you kind of foot in the door and it's just it just seems a shame for so many people to m miss out and there must be a way around that to enable them to kind of to facilitate that more there must be there must be kind there's of a really clever color <laughs> system telling me what <laughs> we're at but i've completely forgotten what it was what does red mean does that, how much more time have I got? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to carry on. Any other questions? <laughs> uh, the gentleman over there. Is that Mr...? Yes. Hello? Uh, go. Uh, can Couple you of tell questions. us who you are? Brian <laughs> Woods. Couple of questions. Uh, one for all... Well, actually, both for all of you. What's your advice to people after they've had the first break about getting their second break? Because sometimes... The first film's really tough, but then getting the second film can be quite hard as well. So what's your advice on getting your second break? And secondly, this is, I was thinking of this particularly for Ellie, but it works for the, t the other two as well. I was thinking, what's the most scared you've ever been? <laughs> Probably undercover, but for the other two, not undercover, but the most scared you've ever been when you've been making a film. Can we start with scared? Because that's such a good question. I mean, they're both <laughs> good questions, obviously, Brian. But um, what, was that, um, um, what was the most scared you've ever been? Obviously, undercover. Uh, the obvious answer is undercover. But I actually think it was before, right before my first documentary came out. 
I just had this moment of like, what if this is absolutely terrible and I just get hurled abuse out on Twitter and I've quit my job for this and it was the most terrible decision ever. Um, so I actually think that that was more scary. It was the fact that I had, in a way, taken a risk to do it and I'd, I'd put so much into it and I loved it so much. I loved making the production and I really wanted to continue working in TV. But I was also very conscious of the fact that it, it might not happen again, that I might have just made that one documentary and that was it. So while meeting landlords undercover, who, uh, yeah, was, was definitely scary, I almost think I felt more scared at that point. Um, so do you want to talk about when you've been scared? So just to recap, Elisa, the questions were one... Sorry, sometimes I miss the closed caption. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the first question was, you've had your first film, your first big break, and it's like, yeah, done it and then actually the next one's just as hard and what's the advice to yeah. to make that to make it not just a one-off and also when have you been most scared when you've been making a, a, a one of your projects okay do, do you want to, to to have a quick answer yeah i think i've already said when i was the most scared was when i hadn't really shot anything and then had to shoot the whole film um <laughs> so it, it, like i was petrified and i just qu often couldn't sleep in the weeks beforehand but what i would say to that is just do it honestly i can't stress enough especially to girls because what i've found is there's a lot of of girls who have ended up producing and are really really brilliant producers and would would be directors and it's just that that piece of kit that like, technical piece of kit that put is quite it seems quite scary but just yeah just grab it because then when you know how, when you can use it you're like oh my gosh it's so much more freeing you can do so much it just gives you so much more freedom when you're making your own films to just go off on your own and and do what you can. Would you give the advice as well, though, don't wait till it's your first film? Yeah, <laughs> no, don't wait till it's your If you can grab it at any just other go, time, can I, yeah. role? can I just go and yeah. do some ways or something? And like, they're expensive kits to hire, so if you're in a production company or on a production, there will inevitably there'll be a camera hanging around somewhere and just say, just ask if you can take it and do, uh, people always say it, but do like film your family or film your mates or, um, take it at the weekend and film anything because mm. um, it would just make you feel a bit more confident, I think. And, and how did you do... Because you're obviously making your second film. Yeah. So was that hard to start again? Did you think, yeah. I'm never going to do that again? Or it was like, no, can't no, wait I was to like, get going? Yeah, it was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that was really hard, but let's go again because it it's really exciting. And I did absolutely love it. But it's, it, it's true, it's harder sometimes that second film because you're still new... Um, and relatively junior, and there aren't that many docs being made, and there's this, you know, incredibly incredible pool of people and people who've got so much more experience than you. So why would they pick you? So I had a kind of difficult. It there was kind of different choices. It's really hard to get the second film. I've spoken to people, and we've said it's it feels harder than the first actually, and and I guess the different paths you can go down in terms of kind of maybe working on a series or. I was quite keen to make a single film again, um, specifically about something I was interested in. And, and then I ended up... It's a quite unusual situation, because it's a BBC Two film, and it's quite a big film for them, which they would never have given to a kind of... It's to me, at that level, is only my second film. So I'm co-directing it with someone I've worked with before, because um, she only wanted to work a couple of days a week, and she's just come back from having kids. So we... It's quite an unusual. Who's that? Rowan Deacon. So I've worked with Rowan oh. before, so we know each other really well, and so it's it's a slightly unusual way of working, but it's enabled me to work on a, a really big film, and it's really challenging, and that I probably wouldn't have got straight away as my second film. I would have. I don't know what. I'd that's probably developed my own idea, and that's a very good piece of advice, though, isn't it? And um, what about you? What's what scared you the most apart from doing this session? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was thinking about when I was doing it after I make the first film when I made the first one I had no idea about how it works and I, I, I was really happy because we were selected in Rio International Film Festival that is one of the biggest uh, festivals in Brazil and for me that was an award to be there and then the film got the award of best film of new trends and that moment I was like Wow, now this film will go everywhere. And it didn't happen <laughs> at all. And like it entered in few festivals. I think 
all of the festivals it it was it it received some award but it was not going to festivals and then i was like what happened and i started to understand how the festivals world works and and it was it was kind of i don't know it was really hard to to deal with this expect you know when you create an expectation expectation about what will come and the thing doesn't happen and I think to the second film I was much more like do not create anything just make the film because you have to make the the, the film and yeah so did it and readjust your expectations yeah you thought, actually yeah and but it's not easy of course now all the time we're trying to work inside this feeling and when you say afraid you say afraid about a situa a real situation yeah. wh where I was filming. Yeah. I went to Angola in 2015 and I was with another journalist, Natalia Viana, and we were doing a height um, research there about a Brazilian uh, company that was working there since ever. And Natalia would write a text about that. And we were thinking what we should make as a film and we decided to to understand because this company has a very had a very big relationship with government in Angola and Angola had the same president for the last 37 years in that year and we had a fantastic idea to make a film about the political prisoners in Angola and it's really smart when you are two, two women traveling in a country that is a dictatorship to make this film and we start to be persecuted since the second day of our trip you know, we saw people following us and then the guy it started to happen a lot of very bizarre situations like people coming to talk with us in the streets saying i know that you did that that and that during this day and then in the building where we was we were like the the guy came and said the police was here four times they asked your passport and blah 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 and you start to be really scary about that situation and we had to ask some help for a Brazilian embassy and we, and I, I understood what it's really feel fear about your personal safety yeah mm. yeah um any other questions uh, this in the front um such a good talk thanks so much um it's a question for Ellie and Lizzie about you know, pitching ideas. Are you pitching, or were you pitching um, when you were a producer to execs you already knew or to commissioners? Like, were you, was there any element of cold emailing people? And does that even work? And, and also, I guess, just a more general question, like, are you finding your best ideas from personal experience or from things that you read in magazines that are already kind of stories anyway. Someone else has designated them as good stories. So sort of two points there is like the, the pitching process, cold pitching, and then yeah. where mm -hmm. do you find your ideas? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you want to start with the pitching? And yeah, um, so mostly it is to people that I've, um, that I've met at some point, but I've had, I've just set up coffees and had lots of meetings with lots of different production companies and got a feel for, you know, what they do, what kind of stories might work for them. Um, so it will vary who I'll take different ideas to. Um, and a bit like Lizzie said earlier, I think you think every idea you come up with is the best new documentary ever. Um, and then for like various reasons, it, it might not get commissioned. Um, but I think, I mean, I don't know, I, I, I personally think that everyone that I've worked with and met in TV is really nice. And I think if you even just ask to meet for a coffee and they've got the time, um, it's worth trying. And then you can get a feel for like the sort of things that they're looking for and then set, take ideas to them. Um, so yeah, I hope that answers your question. Lizzie, do um, you normally work with a production company rather than pitching direct to the broadcasters? Yeah, I guess usually if I'm in with a production company, I would work up an idea and speak to the exec about it who would interrogate that idea and then take it to a commissioner. I guess sometimes if you've got a relationship with a commissioner, you could go straight, straight to them, but that is quite unusual and and so and i guess if you don't have connections to an exec or commissioner you can um you, i've known of people to email commissioners totally out of the blue but i guess it's making sure the idea is thoroughly thought through um because i remember like 
I had an, like year, years ago, I had an idea. I can't remember what it was. It was like addiction to prescription drugs or something. It was like an a real problem at the time. And I remember saying that to a really good exec. I was like, I've got this idea of prescription drugs. And he looked at me and was like, sorry, what? That's not a concept <laughs> or a film. Like, think, think it through. What is the concept? Where are the access points? How would you structure it? And then I think if you've done a little bit more work on it, it's potentially worth sending to, you know, you could take a point and send it to a commissioner then, or try and meet with an exec, um, but rather than just a, a topic. I mean, I, I work a lot, I've worked a lot in development and selling, and I personally wouldn't advise most people to write direct to a broadcaster. I think the, that you, if you've got something exceptional, there's always the exception that proves the rule, but I would, the advice we always give to people is who are making the films that you admire it's really easy to work out who they are because they're at the end in the production caption. Most of them will have a website and just get in touch with the companies or the producers making the programmes you admire. And if you've got something, just send them a very brief email summarising what you have that's extraordinary. I think reading something in a newspaper and going, mm, this is quite interesting, <laughs> probably won't get interest, but I've met this person, I know this story, I've got this amazing access or whatever. They'll probably... Get, invite you in for a chat if you've got something special. And then, because when you are commissioning, they're not just looking at the idea, they're looking behind the idea to who's going to produce this and make sure it gets delivered in a well-produced piece of film. So you, need, you do need support to do that. Or go and start filming it yourself, and then when you've got... I've got a little bit of tape to show you. That then becomes even more compelling. Mm. Um, so, tap over there. Oh, and sorry, we've got about f five more minutes maximum, so this might be the last one, unless it's okay. quite quick. Uh, hi, my name's Andrew. I'm an independent producer here. Uh, just picking up <clears throat> on what you were just talking about in terms of pitching, what is the kind of um, benefit-cost ratio of uh, developing an idea and taking it to someone? So, for example, we talk about commissioners and just sending a log line to get someone hooked on it, or, you know, and this comes, I suppose, with big breaks, uh, have you known people to kind of go, okay, you know what, I'm actually going to go and film a taster for this because I believe in it that much? Or is that sometimes just not actually worth the, yeah, like I said, cost benefit when actually commissioners know kind of already just from a log line? Um, if you could, I, the more effort you make, the more impressed people will be with you if you can be you know you can go out with your phone and shoot an interview and cut it down and you know it's, it, the access to technology is quite open now and quite mm. democratic and if someone goes I've got this and it but keep it short you know 90 seconds of something arresting and interesting that you've got that's unique is much better than words <laughs> I don't know if here it's the same, but in Brazil, it uh, helps a lot to have a teaser. Because sometimes people is like, but it, uh, the idea is good, but how it will be? So if you have some way to show where you want to go and the way that you want to tell the story, I, yeah. I think it's, it really helps. Like most times I go, that, that's quite a good idea. Have you got anything on tape? And then you have to go and do it anyway, so... And I guess it's quite, <laughs> and it's quite hard as well because sometimes I guess you've got an idea in your head of, of you know, you really believe in, and and it's right to stick with it and film a little bit on your phone or or speak to people about it. But then I would also say, keep working as as well in other jobs because it takes such a long time, yeah. um, and and it's so rare for these kind of projects to to be picked up quickly that sometimes you because you can sit there thinking oh it's definitely gonna happen because it's kind of I know it's amazing mm. and then you don't want to be you know kind of stuck in like a final yeah, I, I'm gonna be really hypocritical because mm. I literally sweat and agonize over a 90 second sizzle that I'd take to a channel yeah. but I would say don't sweat it too much just yeah. get something and say oh look at this and that sort of rawness yeah. and authenticity and look there's this amazing piece of Mm. A character I've just gotten into. My boss actually, who's a really, really experienced exec, sat with a channel the other day and went, I'm really excited about this. In fact, I, I chatted to this girl on Skype. Here she is on his phone. And they went, oh, yeah, that's quite good, isn't it? You know, and, it was, and I've been yeah. sitting there doing a taster. And it's like, oh, yeah, sometimes just a, a really compelling person chatting on a Skype chat can be enough.
Well, so I think ask for feedback if it is a no, because there's some of the things that I've worked on that have morphed out of another idea and from conversations with execs that I've worked with and from their feedback from the channel, it's gone from something that was completely different to an, this documentary that was commissioned in the end. So if they say, no, it's not for us now, I'll say, okay, can I ask why? Is there anything that you are particularly looking for? Is there something in it that you might be interested in? Um, there's been a red light flashing for ages, which I think <laughs> means you will have to shut up and go. So um, thank you so much for coming and thank you to our great panel. <laughs>